He's a serial entrepreneur by age 18. He had climbed from busboy to operations manager for two hospitality companies, uh, grossing over $20 million. He co-founded Neon Root at 22 and has since partnered with Fortune 100 companies like Exxon and media moguls like Snoop Dogg and Tony Robbins. Um, last year, he was featured in IMC.com? Yeah, Inc.'s really cool. Inc.com's 2016 list of 30 under 30 most brilliant entrepreneurs. So clearly, he has a lot of insight regarding building um, successful apps. So we're really happy to have him here, share his knowledge with all of you. Um, just make sure there are some resources that um, he provided us with. There, there's a, a handout you guys can take with you. And there is a book that's listed there as print, but if you just Google it, there is an online version. I just Google this on there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Ben. Cool. Um, hey guys, really, uh, really good to be here. Um, two of my execs are alma mater at USC, so nice to be uh, doing things for the community. Um, yeah, so I work with a lot of music and media folks um, right now working with Diane Word on some digital stuff on their global tour, um, working with Cash Money, which is Drake, Nicki Minaj, uh, and Lil Wayne, um, Spotify, so a lot of entertainment and media stuff. So I'm kind of the guy that these rappers go to when they want to build an app. Um, has anybody, before I kind of dive in, has anybody um, done any web development, mobile, built an app, bootstrap, Cool. What's your name? Jade. Jade. Um, what's your What's your experience with that development? Interesting. I mean, I don't code myself, so I hired you know outside engineers to work on it for me, and especially not coming from an engineering background, it's frustrating. Right. And do, were they overseas? Um, half and half. Okay. So like their management and some engineers were here, and then I guess some back end engineers were overseas. Cool. So that's kind of also what we're going to be talking about today. Um, a lot of people, there's a misconception of, you know, why do apps fail? It's not really the tech or even really the engineering. It's like the product owners. That's the most important thing. So I circulated some material on kind of what makes a good product owner, how to keep, uh, you know, yourself accountable to the dev team, vice versa, manage expectations, all that stuff. And then today we're going to get into kind of the road mapping and how we approach app development. Yeah. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, I, I do a lot of content as well, guys. So if you guys um, are interested in new tech, um, I write about a lot of cool stuff. Sometimes it piss people off, like they become enthusiasts. Got trolled pretty hard last week on Reddit for one of my posts. But, um, yeah, Forbes, Inc., Business.com, and HuffPo. Uh, those are my columns. A lot of our work is featured in... Uh, different PR, um, also very much involved with viral content marketing. So if you guys are familiar with kind of Instagram comedians like Vitaly or Perp Drink or Peaks, um, we do a lot of different deals where we help brands leverage influencers. So we'll touch a little bit about that today too. So Sony Awards, best mobile app dev company in the US, Geeky Awards, um, and our full list is on neonroots.com if anyone is interested in seeing more. Um, so Neon Roots is our innovations company. We do a lot of our own IP. We also kind of have more marquee level services that we do through that company. Rootstrap is our road mapping company. And that's kind of a fancy word for, you know, building an app blueprint. Um, writing the requirements, writing the user stories, doing the wireframes, um, building an app is much like building a house. So you're going to uh, you know, meet with your general contractor first, spec it out, decide how many bedrooms you have, where's the pool gonna be, you're gonna wanna make all these decisions before getting into code. Um, a lot of people, the, the, the model is kind of designed to push you into development. You know, that, that's the problem with the agency model um, and the problem that Jade may have experience where it, it, they're not really thinking through strategy. It's all about building and building and sending an invoice for hours or scope or however you know, the model is building for it. So it's really, really important that you go through what we call the rootstrap phase to validate, test, prototype your idea uh, before actually building and, and kind of having your Lego block turn into a nice big app. Um, also, it's important to focus on, you know, for sure, uh, 
Gregory probably talked about MVP a little bit. Um, if you did, minimum viable product. You know, what is the least amount of work and features for my app to get data, to get users, to gain traction? Um, a lot of times, especially in entertainment clients that I work with, Snoop Dogg especially, um, he's the biggest feature creep. He smokes a lot and comes with crazy <laughs> ideas in Texas at all hours. Um, he was kind of under, with his first startup, he was under the assumption that releasing an app is kind of like a big red carpet movie premiere. It's got to be perfect. Every feature has to be this, and every, you know, all the bells and whistles and all that, like, wrong. If your app doesn't have bugs on a first release, that's a problem. It should be buggy. Software is constantly evolving and iterating and changing and upgrading. That's why you guys, you know, constantly are updating your new software and version 2.345, whatever. Um, so it's never changed, or excuse me, it's always changing. It never just kind of like stays, you know, so if that makes sense. Um, so the notion of build fast, release, you know, these buzzwords you've heard, they're true. So what is the actual minimum viable product um, in some cases, it can be a landing page. In some cases, it can be a WordPress site. In some cases, it can be um, a Facebook page or a Snapchat channel. That could be an MVP. Um, you know, proving and validating something and then building more custom tech and bells and whistles and all that stuff. But letting data make those decisions versus being like Snoop and smoking too much and coming up with crazy ideas. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit about you know our app culture, um, very much like Silicon Beach on HBO. I would say we can identify with probably almost every character in that uh, show. So yeah, it's it's a little bit of a crazy world, uh, but it's fun. It's really really cool to see ideas come to life, especially non-technical people. So we love working with startups that really have no bad background, agile development experience, whatever you want to call it, because we're kind of starting from a clean slate. They don't have um, past traumatic experiences with different vendors or getting burned by an overseas team. So we actually like working with uh, product owners and startups that don't have much experience and we can guide them and provide a white glove service throughout the process. So why do we do Rootstrap? Um, again, this is the first stage of an app development for us. Um, it's typically a three to four week process. A lot of people, again, entertainment clients, Tony Robbins, for example, um, he had tried building, if you guys don't know him, he's a big author, uh, self-help coach, you know, medium, mogul empire. Um, he tried building that for five years before he met us. He worked try to transition through multiple vendors. He's a really, really tall guy. He's really intimidating. He's got like 20 people around him all the time. A lot of security. And you know, he's kind of the type of person that when he asks for a cupcake, you know, someone from his team comes back and brings him the whole bakery. So he's not really used to hearing no a lot, especially when it comes to his first ever digital property. And we were tasked with digitizing 39 years of his content library. So when we met him, his CIO dropped a huge box. He's like, all right, here's your research, and it's just a bunch of CDs and DVDs. Like, we were like, what the hell are we gonna do with these? We literally had to find someone on Craigslist, transcribe it all, um, and you know, that was the first problem, and that's what we told them. So the very first kickoff meeting, there were probably 13, 14 people from his executive team in this conference room, so really like this one, and we identified who shouldn't be there, you know? And that was something new to them because they all felt like they had a voice. And, well, I think the app should do this. And I think it should function this way. And, and we said, well, we don't really care. We need one product owner. So we can leave the room and you guys can decide. No, 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 we're ready. And they start kind of freaking out. And, OK, OK, you know, Kate knows all the content. She'd make a good product owner, but she doesn't know tech. I said, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll ramp her up. Um, in 13 weeks, we launched his app and got him an ROI, basically paid back all the fees he paid to us in 13 weeks. So wow. that was a cool case study. Yeah. Does that include the bootstrap process, the whole building? I was yeah, like, so that, good. So that does not. So it was a dev cycle that was about 13 weeks plus bootstrap, which was about three and a half. But um, we get pushback because 
with someone like Tony Robbins. I want to start building an app now. I want to code now. And we're like, no, that's not how this works. You need a plan, you need a prototype, make decisions internally or have your product owner do it and then build. So a lot of times people want to skip that process and it's our job to you know, manage expectations, how we work and push back. So kind of some of the basics of how do we do Rootstrap. Um, you know, understanding the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, defining things, building basic requirements of as a user, I should be able to do this task. As an admin, I should be able to do something else. Um, you know, really the best way to communicate an app is not through, you know, this bloated pitch deck. It's just through storytelling. So if you feel most comfortable doing that in a video or in just plain text, um, you know, tell a story of what your app should do and what you want it to do versus trying to, you know, create this feature document that has 20 pages and all these specs because the chances are your engineer is not going to understand it. So keep it simple at first. Um, ideate and understanding that software is an iterative process. So it's constantly changing and evolving, um, especially with first time product owners and entrepreneurs. It's very common that they're building an app to solve their own problem. You know, that's why Zuckerberg or NHB or whatever, they came up with ideas of the Tinder guys, which are USC, Sean and Justin. Um, they came up with things that they want to solve for themselves. At times, there is a departure where, you know, building the right product and the data might not be from the original vision of the creator anymore. And it's kind of, they have to go through this challenge of building a product that they may not even use anymore but the data says it's the right product. You know, this happens a lot. So in that instance, it's really important to be very objective in building an app. It's so simple, since it is your baby, to get really emotionally tied to how it looks and functions and feels and all this stuff. None of that's important. Keep it simple, release, make it fancy later. Um, so I'm going to stay on Rootstrap and road mapping for a little bit, and then I'm going to get to some fun stuff of, you know, how do you build an audience? Because it's not like the field of dreams when you build an app, but just because you put it out there, people aren't going to come. Um, so three and a half week process, kickoff is usually 10 to 2, 10 to 3. Um, we do about five or six per month between LA and New York. Um, and we've hit capacity every month since we started, five years ago. Um, we have a fairly high success rate on fundraising too. So 14% of our alums have gotten a quarter million dollars in seed financing. So that's a nice social proof for us. We've seen a lot of good acquisitions too, um, from Rootstrap to you know acquisition in 23 months with an influencer network that we recently worked with always fun to see and kind of follow the journey of how uh, an entrepreneur either works with us or internalizes the dev or maybe even another vendor after the rootstrap stage. So we always like to stay kind of in close contact with them. Um, in terms of some of the exercises we do and like what are we doing in this rootstrap stage? Um, we do, you know, vision canvases or lean canvases. Um, there's a lot of resources online for vision canvases. GetArbor.io is a tool that we've used. It's free, it's open source, we made it accessible to everyone. Um, number one on Product Hunt as well, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, that helps you write your user stories. Again, that's very simple, plain English description of what is the intent. What is, what is your feature trying to do? As a user, I should be able to log into Facebook so that I can use this app. Um, as a user, I should be able to go into my account so I can check my balance. Again, whatever the app is, keep your user stories as simple as possible. Um, you also have admin stories, or you might have multiple user types. So with Facebook, you know, you can have as a user, I should be able to log into my app. 
as an advertiser, as an advertiser, should be able to publish ads. Um, as an admin, should be able to blue check somebody. You know, all these various user types and roles. So understanding those <coughs> at really the basic level of your requirements gathering before wireframing, before design, um, is, is something critical and something you're going to want to do. Any questions so far? Cool. Um, so once you've got your requirements down, this is when you can start moving into the sexy stuff in design. Um, this is at least the way we approach it. Uh, we always stick with lo-fi stuff first. Um, try to find. I'll show you some examples after what that, what these actual deliverables look like. Uh, but lo-fi is, is sketching. It's just drawing black and white boxes. Um, you, there's a lot of templates. Balsamic, is, I think, has a good tool. Um, if you want to use something off the shelf, you can Google also just wireframing tools. Uh, what you're doing is really mapping out the journey of a user, the customer experience, uh, and understanding you know, how many screens does your app have, or your website, or your web app, and your mobile app. Um, at, at that stage, some decisions should have been made already on platform. Is this going to be a native app? Native being native iOS or Android? Is it going to be a hybrid app? Um, you know, when you go to facebook.com, m.facebook.com, you, you're, you're seeing a hybrid app. That's HTML5. It's both web app and mobile app. Um, are you, yeah, so those are the main things to uh, identify with the tech. Also, you've got other things like, you know, Slack. Um, Slack is a great tool for creating Slack bots. It's got an interface already designed, so a lot of people build apps for, for Slack. Um, once you have a pretty good feel of wireframing, um, again, mapping out the journey from a user side, admin side, this is when we'll typically get into visual language and design. Um, we like to stay away from branding, so it's not uncommon for an app to go live without a brand. And that sounds weird, um, but that's the reality. Snapchat, however many billions they have, changed their name to Snaps when they IPO, before they IPO. Um, so it's okay to not really know what your brand is or have it defined. In fact, we like to almost push that off because it's just not a good use of time and resources when you're trying to validate and test the concept at the early stage. A lot of people um, get very hung up on branding. It's a very, very subjective thing. A lot of opinions, especially if you've got multiple co-founders or stakeholders. Um, so we kind of like to you know, defer branding, or yeah, work on branding once we have our base and foundation. So once we have uh, our visual language defined pattern, um, style guide, we put together a prototype. So for us, a prototype is a model car without the engine, probably the best way to describe it. There's no back end, there's no logic, it's entirely click through. Um, for our customers, the main business case is using it to go raise money. So people use our deliverables, they go fundraise, um, and talk to friends and family, angels, VCs, etc. Uh, in others, it's to test. You know, to make sure and validate that uh, this is an idea worth pursuing or an app worth building. When you do this, it's important to go outside your network because if you talk to your mom or your brother or your sister, they're likely going to say, yeah, this is super cool and I'm lying to you. Um, so, you know, go to Starbucks, offer to pay someone five bucks, you know, try to get um, as many unbiased opinions and feedback as possible. Especially at this early stage because right now you've only wasted three and a half weeks. So real quick, yeah. Back up. How? What if we wanted to do bootstrap? How do? What does it cost? How do we pay for it? Do sure. Take equity, etc. Um. So model right now is twelve thousand for startups, and we get about sixty applications per month. Fifty percent of that is credited to development. So that's really the biggest incentive for entrepreneurs is that. 
um, they're only paying 6,000 for Rootstrap. And if you want to use Rootstrap to then find a CTO, you can do that. If you want to uh, use Rootstrap and then develop with our team, great. If you want to use Rootstrap, take a break and fundraise, awesome. Um, the idea is keeping it as flexible as possible for the client, for the product owner, um, not getting locked into long-term engagements or commitments. You never want to do that in development because once you work with a toxic vendor, it's very difficult to transition and find someone who can just pick up and resume. Um, it's a lot easier said than done. And that's why you have to sometimes rebuild from scratch a lot when we do rescue mission type stuff. Um, so if you are interested, rootstrap.com. Um, our road mapping process, we'll talk a little bit more about the details. Equity is something that we do once we've dated for a little. It's, you never really want to give equity to uh, a vendor you're paying fees to. And there's a lot of companies out there that do that, and I just think it's bullshit and uh, unethical because they're taking your money, charging you, you know, rack rate for their service fees and taking equity. So it just doesn't feel fair um, for the entrepreneur. So our thing is we usually like to do it after we work with a client or, or customer for, you know, at least a couple months. What types of guarantees do you give your customers as far as just getting them through the three and a half week process or I don't know, do you see where I'm going with this? Do you say, hey, we're gonna get you to here? Yeah, I mean, we, we tap focus groups, we bring in, we do as much as we can to validate. Um, there's plenty of times I say, no, don't build this. Mm -hmm. Or somebody pays me 12 grand and I give them a beautiful app and all this really cool designs and I'm like, you don't need this, go start a Snapchat channel. And then I'll grow that and then you can build custom tech. And at first, the customer was like, I can't reveal his name, but he was kind of screaming at me, Ben, what the hell, we just paid all this money, oh my god. Calls me a week later, thanks for saving, you know, we started our Snapchat channel, audience is growing like crazy, you know, thanks for saving us a quarter million dollars in eight months. So, nobody's got a crystal ball. <laughs> we don't know if it's gonna be successful. But what we do is we de-risk the idea as much as possible. That's kind of the best way we like to uh, Pitch what Rootstrap is. Okay. Um, so I was I wanted to move into growth, user acquisition. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Before I go there, any other questions in the road mapping? Because I know that um, a good chunk of this time is going to be focused on uh, the planning and road mapping. I like growth because it's more fun. I think you guys will like it too. Uh, but let's let's make sure any other questions before we move on. I guess you have like understand and define as your first two terms. How defined does the idea have to be before someone comes to you, you think, typically? I mean, oftentimes it's comparing something, you know, Uber for dogs, or Snapchat for this, or Netflix for that, or Airbnb for this. Um, we get a lot of that. So, I'd say 80% of our applications for Instrap every month are, are, you know, first time founders who I have an idea for an app. Um, I was drunk at the bar. It would be great if, you know, Venmo for this, Bitcoin for that. Um, so that's usually where they're starting. Um, we do send an application process. Where we're vetting people and applications, surprisingly, is not the idea. It's the product owners. We don't want to meet, work with crappy people who you know, want an order taker service and aren't going to listen because the chances of your app pivoting are almost like 100%. In other words, the idea at the time of Rootstrap and then development or the end of Rootstrap has evolved significantly every single time. Sometimes the business model has changed entirely. So we put a lot less weight on the actual idea itself and more on who is behind this? You know, are they capable of raising money? Are they capable of executing? That answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Um, so growth hacking. I just did a talk last night on growth hacking. A lot of people, uh, Snap, I think Snapchat's building. They own kind of all of Venice now, so. Um, <laughs> I think it was one of theirs. And yeah, I, I got to do a lot of fun stuff on this, on this topic. 
Um, does anybody, have, has, has anyone heard of kind of the term growth hacking before? Maybe, no? Okay. Um, growth hacking is just a way to build audiences, convert app installs, um, drive people to a landing page, get people to opt into something. It can be used for any uh, you know, KPI, key performance indicator that you're trying to track uh, with your project, whether it's revenues or downloads or impressions or content or you know, whatever. So one of our most recent successes um, was helping a product called Superscreen uh, go on Kickstarter. We met this entrepreneur, uh, very successful engineer, mechanical engineer, who um, you know came to us with him and his MVP. This was a hardware product. He said, "Hey, Ben." You know, you have a badass team. I know you don't have any crowdfunding experience, but I want your help. I want you guys to help me. And I want to build this product called Super Screen, which is a 10 inch uh, tablet. It's basically an iPad uh, that extends your iOS or Android. So you can literally control the content from your phone uh, or your Super Screen, and vice versa. So, use cases would be. Um, you know, more senior citizens who don't want to learn a new interface or software design and they can pair or mirror, you know, what they see on their smartphone on a much larger tablet display for 99 bucks. Um, same with, you know, maybe mom and kid where when you give your nephew or nieces or kids your phone and they play and screw around with all the settings, now you can just give them a 10 inch tablet and be able to kind of control the content they're watching and viewing. So really cool product, but as millennials, we weren't able to identify with it at all. We were like, this is silly, this is stupid, just go buy a tablet, you know, why would we do this? And we, it started to finally stick to us, or rather, we, we got a little bit more excited when we started doing some really basic things. So. How did we hit the, we're number 11th most funded campaign of all time. Bear in mind, we've never done Kickstarter before, ever. So this is our first crowdfunding experience. Uh, we hit our pledge goal of 50,000 in the first hour. We got 19,000 pledges and we raised 2.53 million. So how did we do this? Um, for starters, before the campaign, we had our pre-campaign launch and we, set up landing pages. What's a landing page? It's a product description page. It's your marketing page. Um, it's basically describing to your audience and your demo what this product is. And what are you trying to capture from a landing page? It's different for every business. In our case, we just wanted an email opt-in. We wanted a really good email so that when we launched uh, for our first hour, we would hit everyone on our pre-subscriber list with you know, an announcement that we're live on Kickstarter and we hope to convert them. So starting with a series of landing pages, there's a lot of good tools out there. Instapages.com, uh, I think Unbounds is another. You do not have to be a designer. If you want to get fancy, you can hire someone on Upwork um, who's maybe specialized in landing pages. It doesn't have to be overly complex. Um, So if anybody wants to go on their laptops, superscreen.io, that's an example of a landing page. Um, so with that project, we wanted to build a pre-campaign list. We wanted to build an audience on Facebook, engage in that audience, and then have this become uh, the, you know, one of the most successful campaigns of all time. So we started with a Facebook group. We quickly, quickly realized um, who our audience was. 65 plus, Sally from Wisconsin, loves the fact that this is $99, she's gonna buy four of them. And eventually creating evangelists where we literally don't even have to sell the product anymore because we're at, engaging so much in the community that on Facebook, people literally in the comments are helping us sell the product, answering questions. Um, creating kind of an early adopter network. That was always the goal. This entrepreneur 
he didn't really need the money to go to manufacturing. He had plenty of runway. Um, for him, it's more bragging rights and saying, I'm the biggest, you know, Kickstarter, blah, 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 of all time. So, you know, that's really the ideal scenario is activating uh, an audience on Facebook, getting them to start to evangelize a product for you. The next most important thing we did was video content. Um, you do not have to be a producer, go to film school, or be super rich or whatever to do video content. You know, go on Craigslist, ask a friend, freelance or whatever. In our case, you know, we weren't really equipped to be a production studio, so we were casting. We were like doing announcements at the office and saying, "All right, whose grandma wants to come in on Friday? We got to start shooting some commercials." And sure enough, it was though it was that content. Our order designer and his grandma, um, and we spoke exactly to that demo that hit all the Facebook Explore pages and did over a million views in five days. And at that point, your ad dollar is going so much further because Facebook is making it go viral. Same thing on Instagram, where you always want to try to have your content go on the Explore page. That means it's viral. Um, so constantly cutting new ads, cutting new content, lots of different variations, um, showing all the use cases. And there's a lot. If you guys have ever flown a drone, um, this is a really, really valuable product for drone users in the drone community because when you use a drone, you can't actually see really what, well, you can see what's going on, but you have to put your phone in you know, the controller and with this product, you can co-pilot now, which is super cool. So you can have someone next to you seeing exactly what's going on the drone while you're flying a drone. So we would come up with these various use cases, and we would film it. OK, who's got a drone? Doesn't have to be fancy, but we're just creating an insane archive of content, putting it on Facebook, cutting ads, all that good stuff. Um, so. Goal number one we hit, which was we wanted 50,000 people to opt in and you know, quality leads that were likely interested in our product. Um, for us as well, because this was a more senior audience, a lot of them didn't know what Kickstarter was. So they're like, I want to just buy this. What is this investment platform? What is this thing called a pledge? What the hell is this? So. Our Facebook community did help with some of those questions, but what we did is we just created simple screencasts. We would put video tutorials, we'd send emails, explaining what Kickstarter is, educating them. Naturally, Kickstarter loved us, so their head of whatever, head of tech would call us, like, thank you so much for, you know, because they're getting, you know, 5% off this project, and we're, you know, bringing in 50% new traffic who'd never heard of this platform before. Um, so the more, Explanation, the more content, the better. I know sometimes less is more, and I'm, I'm usually, I usually stick with that in, in, in business and a lot of things. But when you're talking to your audience, assume your customer's not so smart. Assume they don't read. So overload them with extra resources, information, ways they can find out about things, FAQs, videos, tutorials. Uh, the more, the better. Um, so we hit our 50,000. Pre-subscriber, combination of Facebook ads, Google search ads, Gmail ads, influencer marketing. Um, a lot of people say influencer marketing is snake oil. It can be. Um, it's all about pairing the right you know, influencer with a brand. It's a reality. It can work, um, but if you're a really archaic brand, you're not hip with the latest trends, um, you know, the campaign will likely fail. On the flip side, if you only rely on influencer marketing and vapor, you're going to get burned to the ground like Fire Festival this past week. <laughs> um, you know, they're just, I mean, it's getting crazy, but, you know, they knew this was going to happen and all these influencers were allegedly breaking a lot of FTC violations and all this other stuff that um, I think is, is waking up the industry a little bit on how to be a little bit more cautious of curating brands and influencer deals. 
So it can work. Um, it can be effective. You just need to know how to pair it, uh, make sure they post it at a certain time. Apply the same stuff, you know, root strap it. You know, plan and do strategy before uh, doing any type of viral marketing campaigns or anything like that. The next big thing is engaging with the community. Um, this is especially important because in Kickstarter land, there's a lot of people who drink way too much coffee and just, it's, it's a weird, like, they get to pretend like they're on Shark Tank for a dollar. <laughs> Seriously. Most of them, a lot of them aren't even full pledgers. So they pledge one dollar and they all kind of like know each other. So when we did Kickstarter Live, we brought Techno Buffalo, who's a big tech influencer, review our product. We saw these guys like, hey Jimbo, good to see you here. Like they all kind of know each other. It's this it's like quiet underground, it's kind of like a betting gambling community. They're very addicted to it, um, but they're, they're wound up and you need to be prepared for that. And that, that was something we were not. Um, we thought, okay, we, we did all of the work, we got our 50,000 people ready to go, we're gonna launch, we hit our pledge, but we're done. No. Um, I almost got a stomach ulcer in 30 days, I'm so crazy. No, it's, it's intense. And you need to be very communicative with your uh, community um, and you know, understand that there's gonna be trolls and doxers and haters and people talking shit and all that. It's, it's par for the course, you know? Um, a lot of projects, big ones, Pebble, they did 12 million, which was a smartwatch. You know, they went bankrupt. So it's, it's a very, you know, heated community. Um, so approach crowdfunding with caution, be prepared, um, have a marketing budget. It's not for everybody, if you can, I would, I would prefer uh, a family and friends round for fundraising any day over crowdfunding. It, you know, we did a lot, we did great, um, but it was a tremendous amount of work, very, very exhausting, physically, emotionally, and uh, yeah, I, I might be taking a little break from crowdfunding for a while. <laughs> um, the next thing is, uh, you know, again, updating, so continuing communication, through channels like um, Kickstarter, email lists, private Facebook groups. In our case, again, we, we continue to answer questions and people don't read, so we use chatbot technology. We, we created a chatbot um, that is natural language that allows customers to ask questions and this chatbot would engage with it and answer questions. So that's a way where you can um, not have to have so much manpower and customer service for these 19,000 people who all want their product now. Um, so that's, you know, chatbot tech is something that should be on everybody's radar. You know, AI is a much larger topic we won't get into today, but I think chatbot stuff is, is very interesting. There's a lot of use cases that can be applied to what you guys are doing and your, your future startups. Um, so yeah, PR was key. Um, we got on a, almost every major publication you can think of, went viral on Reddit multiple times and different subreddits. Um, with PR, make, when you guys have opportunities for PR for yourself, your own brand, your own companies, make sure you have, the, the simplest rule is make the other person do as little work as possible. They don't want to write, they don't want to do anything. They can't sit, tell you to write the thing for them because that would be you know, <laughs> breaching their contract that they signed, but that's what they want. So the tighter of a draft you can provide to a writer, the better. Um, make it so simple for them to literally copy, paste, change a few things, and that's what they're gonna do. That's growth hacking, <laughs> simple as that. Um, you know, reaching out to certain publications that would find the story fascinating. Uh, also, it's not common to kind of like do a scratch your back type scenario with PR, where someone will say, hey Ben, I can get super screen on this, can you cover you know, a project for me on Inc? Um, and that's totally fine, it's totally ethical, that, that, that's what PR is. 
Um, just have to be transparent. If you guys do decide to ever write or have a column, you know, just kind of tell your editors. Uh, that's a really, really important part is getting, you know, PR, getting those logos featured in the social proof um, that creates, you know, com customer confidence. They've seen it on a major publication. Um, this is a credible product, and I think I'm gonna buy it or pledge. All right, so let's get back to apps. So this is a company we acquired last year. Um, 99 Cent Brains uh, is run by a brilliant artist, uh, creator, developer by the name of Frankie Aguilar. Um, he, him and I crossed paths when he originally came up with a vision and developed Snoopify. Um, which we also own, which was kind of pre-stickers on iOS 10, uh, the most successful, I think TechCrunch called it the most successful photo bombing app of all time. You could put, you know, superimpose images of Snoop and joints and other stuff on your images. So it's, it's fun, it's playful, it went viral. Um, so we decided to make an acquisition with Frankie and his company Mainly for the data. Um, a lot of these apps, you know, are, are, are I would classify them as entertainment. Um, so this is another thing when you're you're going through Rootstrap is, you know, don't be afraid to build an app that might just be a trend or you know a meme. A lot of the you know Bitmoji was sold to Snapchat, and that started with just a trend. Um, I come from the hospitality world, and the hospitality world, you know, when we build a nightclub, we're going in with the expectation that this nightclub's gonna be hot for nine months, and we're gonna have to, you know, change the name, get some new sofas, furniture, new bottle service, out waitress outfits, you know, just, you know, reskin it. Sometimes it's the best way to approach an app development project like that. So, sitcom, fun app, uh, featured, in US and Canada uh, that we built internally that allows you to turn your video content into a 90s sitcom. So laugh <laughs> tracks, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, also, it's really cool to see you know, who the audience really is and who's buying content here. It's not little kids, it's not millennials spending money. It's, it was about females 35 plus. So it's always surprising to get you know insights of who is actually your audience because everybody wants to build apps for millennials. Millennials don't spend money. Millennials don't have loyalty. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I don't really want to build anything for them. I want to build it for Sally in Wisconsin, who's got two kids, and she's spending, you know, like hundreds of dollars on Pokemon Go still. <laughs> um, so, you know, 99 Cent Brains, a lot of these apps in the portfolio were great. They were huge hits for several months. Um, you know, you can see here. I think in one year in red, they did one million in uh, digital goods that were sold, stickers, uh, other you know digital content upsells. Lots of good juicy data, um, but you know there was a decline in, in engagement. So we wanted to come in and reactivate some of these apps. Um, use some of the data, analyze some of the data. Uh, so there's always different plays and strategies with you know acquiring a company, merging, um, starting a new one. Again, we knew going in that a lot of this portfolio had a lot of sexy stuff, but it was already kind of fading, and the trends for them were gone. Um, cat Wayne, you guys may be familiar with. It's just you know cool cats, but. That's where Tyler, the creator, got his character from. So we've also, for us, it's kind of the highest form of flattery, but a lot of our artwork was inspired, stolen, um, you know, by other big influencers and, and creators. Um, so don't be afraid to know or have all the, you know, have all the answers right now. At the rootstrap stage in your development, how am I going to make money? What's the business model here? You can build a trendy app, and you can build a lot of really great data. Um, that's totally reasonable 
uh, approach to product development. You know, I, I'd say the best, next best thing you could say is, I don't know. You know, don't be afraid to say that. It's probably the smartest thing you can do. Um, especially with VCs or people who are in the tech industry and they're gonna ask you a lot of questions and poke holes at your app in every way they can. If you don't have the answer, and don't look stupid making a lot of fake stuff up or whatever, or fluff. Say, I don't know. I'll get back to you. We're still working on it. Um, most of these companies, they don't know what their business model is until they put it out. So, again, that's sometimes the smartest thing you can say. So you're saying in that case, the, the play is just to get data and sell it to bigger tech companies? I'm saying that it's okay to not necessarily know what your revenue streams are. I think it's a big, a lot of, that's a big blocker for a lot of startups to move into the marketplace is they don't have a business model. I don't know, you know, I don't see somebody paying $5 a month subscription. I see somebody using this for free, um, but maybe ads is not going to be the best way. You know, how, how is this company going to make money? Data is another big way to make money. So understanding that it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all type scenario. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can have revenue streams through a digital product or app. But if you don't know your revenue streams even remotely going into it, what's the point in putting money into developing the product if you're not going to get anything on the back end? Sure. Again, ideal scenario is you've got a fully flushed out product roadmap. You know exactly how you're going to make money. Um, it's very, very, very kind and dry and clear. The reality is most startups don't have that. Um, so it's it's good to have some kind of alternatives in terms of you know how can this produce on the back end through ads through data if it's not um, if it is going to be a free app. Okay. So you know we talked about video, um, you know the sort of omni-channel approach is is very very important. Um, I imagine this room watches Gary B or Grant Cardone. I, I get a little nauseous sometimes. These guys kind of they're they're you know they're, they put out good stuff sometimes, but it gets a little overwhelming. Um, I met a lot of them, and it's it's all kind of a show, and they do a really great performance. You know, they're really really good promoters, um, and. It's been a challenge for a lot of these older guys, especially Tony, who's, you know, his big hands can barely use an iPhone. Like, he literally has to have two executive assistants do his Instagramming, and, you know, he, he didn't even text me. He used his voice memos because his hands are so big. So, in that case, it was really hard for him to embrace and understand his value of social media. He's now, you know, probably 1.8 million followers on his Instagram. Um, they double that on Facebook. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Nobody can predict what's going to happen to Snapchat. Nobody can predict what's going to happen to Reddit or Twitter. So, you know, the short answer is try to be consistent as possible on every platform. Um, especially starting out. You don't know which one's going to convert the best for you. Um, so try to have kind of a cohesive strategy across as many platforms as possible. Also, um, where we've had a lot of success when it comes to influencers is not Kendall Jenner um, or, you know, Kardashian influencer, it's micro-influencers, people who have you know, 20,000, 30,000 followers on Twitter, um, but we can get 500 retweets. You know, we can get insane engagement from these people, and we have a network that is collectively, you know, 10 million, comprised of multiple micro-influencers. Uh, that's a really, really, really effective uh, strategy for us when driving app installs, is identifying different influencer networks. Um, creating the content is critical, so this is an app we um, created, which was basically uh, Tamagotchi for growing your own cannabis plant. 
Um, so we waited to, yeah, it's super fun. It's called Pocket Buddy in the App Store if you guys are interested. Um, we waited for Apple to kind of allow cannabis uh, apps in the gates. So right when they did that, uh, we jumped in and we were one of the first ones since it was Khalifa just came out with a similar game of kind of growing and, and nurturing and taking care of your plant. Um, but yeah, it, it was a really fun product. We learned a lot. Um, and we were heavily reliant on influencers. And excuse me, micro-influencers. So the key thing is, is content. That's how you know if you stay relevant. Pocket Buddy listens to 21 Savage once. Um, notice we don't even have any links. So how does somebody find us? They're seeing this content and then they're organically going into the app store. They're searching. And just like hitting the explore page with your video content, the goal with an app is uh, you want to try to get search and trending as quickly as possible. Um, so, you know, we did, we got number 23, could have got a little bit more stars, but that's also another thing is don't be afraid to put a product out because you need feedback, good and bad, and that's how you iterate. Um, so, you know, we did different variations of this kind of content, you know, a picture of Kanye West at a later game, at a plant, people like that stuff, people engage in that stuff. Um, so that was a really, really critical strategy and technique for us to hit feature pages, get PR, eyeballs, and revenue, um, because we're selling digital stuff inside. So this is, um, this is a fun one with Snapchat. Um, this is probably one of my favorite growth hacks that I don't talk enough of, which is um, Kickster. So they were a startup, I, I, presumably a shoe startup, I don't remember exactly what they did. But the founder was obsessed with DJ Khaled's Instagram. And he followed it, he engaged with it everywhere, he wanted to find him, see him, whatever. So, he kind of came up with a scheme where he knew DJ Khaled was going to be at an event. So what he did was, the day before this event that DJ Khaled was planning on being at, he created a Snapchat geofilter. This is the one that we have at our office in Creative Studio, wavehouse.la, if you want to see more. But that's what our geofilter looks like. Um, now, if you don't know what a geofilter is, it's an ad on Snapchat. Any business can buy one. In this case, he created an ad for Kickster with a little DJ Cali emoji and all that stuff. Now what happened? DJ Cali, being the big Snapchat power user that he is, went to this event, saw that filter, liked it, used it, and boom, it went viral. He spent $17.54 and got 10 and a half million impressions. So talk about a growth hack. Um, and thinking outside the box. That is, a, that is a cool one. And look at some Kickstarter's filter mass over 95 million plus views for 17 bucks. Any questions on that, or what Snapchat geo filters are? They're location-based. So again, you're buying a radius. You can buy uh, pretty much as much as you want. And you know, obviously, the larger the radius, the more expensive the ad. In this case, he bought it for a specific zone, and it was 17 bucks. You know, I think with building any type of product or startup, 
not trying to reinvent the wheel is something really, really important. Use tech that's already out there. Use communities that are already out there. Um, so if you want feedback, create a Facebook page and invite people to it. Exactly. Okay. You did a lot of videos for Super Screen. Mm -hmm. How did you put out in what period of time? So we had camera operator and editor um, pretty full time, pretty much full time on that project for the duration of the campaign. I'd say two dozen videos. Okay. Yeah. So a decent amount. Again, use cases trying to uh, show the demographic of what that potential user is using the product. That's also something that Facebook and Instagram's algorithms are looking for in content. They want good quality content, and they'll reward you for that. In that case, in our case, um, Napoleon, our designer, and grandma got a million views in you know week one. Yeah. And those 24 videos in about a month. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. mm -hmm. Over a month time. Okay. And so, what, in that month, what was your marketing ad PR spend like? Pretty decent. Um, I'd say we were spending it's about seventy to eighty thousand a week in Facebook ads. Yeah. Is that nationwide or just? Nationwide? Um, we were doing nationwide. Um, however, again, you never know until you test. We quickly learned our number one market was Singapore. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So that was, and we there was a lot of foreign press. Another growth hack we did was we took native languages from different countries and used that native PR in our page because we figured Singapore speak in English, but for our Japanese audience, you know they maybe couldn't read all the English reviews, so we had foreign native text um, on the design of the page. And if you want to take it a step further, probably doing that in the videos, if we had more time, I would have done that. So try to subtitle things you guys probably see in your video content on Instagram. Um, more use of subtitles because people don't want to listen to someone screaming at them all the time. Um, I would encourage you to do that if you have the bandwidth or resources in your video content, creating subtitles. How do you finance that when it's so quickly evolving? Um, Kickstarter itself, or? No, the ads for the video. Um, a really rich dude gives <laughs> a big check and says, go spend my money and make you the number one Kickstarter. Um, no, uh, in all seriousness, you, you don't have to have that much money, and you probably shouldn't have that much money when starting out, because it's really easy to lose yourself in Facebook and start spending like $20 an install. Um, so I actually would recommend, and this is what we did with Super Screen, is starting small. We started with 5K, 10K, uh, optimizing, getting a grip of our acquisition costs, all the very important metrics before you know double downing on a certain campaign. Um, so that's that's I, I'm also doing promoted or boosted. Um, content is another way, and it's very cheap and very effective. Um, I'd say the one that I like the most is retargeted. Retargeting ads are awesome. My mom, you know, gave me a call, I don't know, a month ago, and she's like, you know, Benny, I knew your company was doing well, but I didn't know it was that. Like, it's, I see your ads all over the place. Like, every time I open a window, your ad is there. Your ads are everywhere. Like, how much money do you spend on advertising? I'm like, Mom, we're, 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 we're crawling you. You know, we're, we're retargeting you. Um, but, you know, I appreciate that. And, you know, retargeting is, um, can be done in a lot of ways. You can, you know, swap audiences. If you have a similar competitor and maybe you know a good product that complements what you're doing, you can share audiences, and it's, you know you can do it in encrypted ways where they're not getting access to that email database. They're ingesting it in Facebook, and then you retarget those people on Facebook. Retargeting ads are so cheap, and most people think it's really expensive because you're seeing it all over the place. Um, it does work. It is effective. So that's for me my, my favorite. Have any other questions?
questions?